Um, anyways, I wanted to go ahead and just introduce uh, a friend that I met through my palliative care masters, um, Miss Denise, Miss Denise Walsh. Um, and so I just want to thank her for trying this with me because this is very new. So um, is there anything that you want to say? I'm just so impressed by everything you're doing, Regina, and you're you're really making a difference in the field. I'm just so proud of you, really. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it's definitely a learning experience. <laughs> um, well, nobody knows anything about this, really. You know, it's just a new field, you know? Yeah, no, for, for sure. And I don't think people realize what they don't know. Um, <laughs> but anyways, what... I was in a class with you and we were doing an online post and um, you brought up a discussion about your mother-in-law um, that I was really like drawn to. And um, I felt that there were some, maybe some regrets there just of like what was unknown at the time. Um, so do you mind just sharing the story about what happened with your mother-in-law? Well, um, my mother-in-law, and this was in 2005, uh, we got a phone call. She had had, she had gone into sepsis um, and um, we got a call from her physician that she was being put on a ventilator and that we should come out. We were living in Las Vegas at the time and we needed to go to Los Angeles to say our goodbyes basically. And um, when we got there, she was on the ventilator and um, I was trying to communicate with her and ask her what I could do for her. And, um, you know, it's impossible to communicate with somebody when they're on a ventilator. And I, what we ended up doing was going through the alphabet and spelling a word. And so the only word I, I said, is there something I can do for you? And she, she said, yeah, you know, I think she nodded yes. And then I, she said, I said, what is it? I said, let's spell it. And I went through the alphabet and if she got to the letter that she wanted, she would squeeze my hand or blink her eyes or something like that. And so it was like, so we'd go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And she got to H and she squeezed my hand and okay, I said H. And then we went through the whole rest of the word and it, the word turned out to be home. She wanted to go home. And I said to her, you want to go home? And she said, yeah, you know, she nodded yes. Mm -hmm. And she was on a ventilator. The doctors told us, when they took her off the ventilator, she was just going to pass. Um, she was very septic. And um, I said, I really was very dismissive because, I mean, when you're on a ventilator and I, I just assumed that you would just pass as, you know, as soon as they took the ventilator out and we couldn't transport her with the ventilator in my limited knowledge. And no one at the facility had said, hey, yeah, you can. So I'm not to blame the facility because it was a phenomenal facility, but I felt very responsible. And I have a lot of regret that she, that I let her die in the hospital when she asked if she could go home to pass away. Yeah. Well, one is definitely, like I've said multiple times already, that's not something, I, it's definitely not something that was in your control at the time. I mean, I feel like it's like a, it's multiple issues, right? It's like, did the conversation happen with you all before? It could have been the facility. It could have been having more education about it, but it, so it's not, it's not your fault. So I guess to go back to that, like, so she was living at home prior to this. Uh -huh, at her home. Uh -huh. And so had you or your husband, her son ever, um, and your husband's name is Peter, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you all ever have um, conversations with her about what she wanted? Well, she had an advanced directive, but um, you know, she didn't want to be kept alive, but she didn't say anything about going home to pass away on that. But I, she did make that wish known when we were in the hospital the day before she passed away. Yeah. And so I guess, so you said her advanced directive said she didn't want to be kept alive. And so did she, do you know if she specifically, if it said like, do not resuscitate, don't intubate. And if you don't know, it's okay. I don't, I don't no, that's fine. That actually, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so, you know, you got to the, but the conversation never really happened, right? You know, there was an advanced directive. Yeah. And that's yeah. like one, yeah. yeah. And that's one of the biggest things I think that I'm hearing now. And I think we've heard, I don't know if it was in our class or in a class that I was in, 
maybe you'll hear it in the pa palliative care 601 course, but it's just having that conversation is like most important. Like people can have the paperwork, but it's translates so differently when you actually hear a person say something. You're right. You're absolutely right. And it, and as I don't know if, I think it was in this class that I'm taking the communi communications and palliative care, the one I'm taking this semester, it just talks about that document as being like a very fluid, very moving target. So um, the course that we took together, I, after I, you know, we were talking about advanced directives. I mean, I have one, my husband has one, um, but I never really spoke about it to anybody. I always just thought it was a personal thing. But now that we're like all out and proud of being death people, uh, <laughs> I am like pushing people. I, I mean, all my friends, when I'm on a walk, do you guys have an advanced directive? Do you have an advanced directive? You know, I mean, I'm like Miss advanced direct I should sell them advanced directives for sale you know I mean I can make some <laughs> I don't know. but no I'm so big on pushing advanced directives mm -hmm. so that's a huge thing for me you know I I just think it speaks a lot but like you're saying it is really a moving target it's not like you can say you know you see it on paper but you don't talk about it you should have it on paper and then discuss it and every so often you really should discuss your uh, advanced directives and, and maybe even rewrite it you know yeah i mean because it, wishes do change depending on what life circumstances are but also it's like that piece of paper um it's just so black and white it's like yes i want this no i don't want this and that's usually not how things happen right right like nowhere in the paperwork did it ask even a question about you know if you had the option to go home if you're in the hospital would you want to go home and pass there uh -huh. Yeah. So you have to say that in, and actually in our advanced directives that we do have all that verbiage in there that we want to pass away at home, but you have to write that it's yeah. not a part of the form. Yeah. Yeah. And is that something I guess that you, you and Peter did knowing now what you experienced with your mother-in-law? Like, is that verbiage in there because of what you experienced with her? No, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I don't know if I consciously did it or if he consciously did it that way, yeah. but I think we both would. I think most people would rather die at home, right? I mean, who wants to be in a hospital? Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, I mean, don't. They want to die at home without any interventions. But I guess when something, I get, when something happens, you know, um, you know, say somebody has shortness of breath or or chest pain, you normally like we call 911 and then you get taken to the hospital. And never do we do we rarely realize that that might be what starts the end of life process for us. So right. that's why it's like such a gray area. Yeah, it is a very gray area. And and we're talking about communication in that, in this communication course, which I think you took last semester, right? Did you take communication? I didn't take it yet. We haven't taken it yet. You'll love it because it is all about that and how the family deals with what, what is the black and white on the paper and how they interpret it and what the person's wishes would be, would be and things like that. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so, I guess back to your mother-in-law and what was her, what was her name? Because Amy. Amy. Okay. And I can call her by Amy. That's okay. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, how long was she in the hospital for? Just a few days. Okay. Yeah. They put her on a ventilator pretty much as soon as she got in because she was a real tough cookie. I mean, she was a tiny, tiny little thing, like a maybe five feet and 90 pounds, just a teeny little woman, but just, strong as can be, healthy as can be, lived till the age of 92. She wasn't really ever sick until this moment that she died. You know, she started vomiting and I guess she must have had a bowel obstruction, I think is what happened and um, and then became septic very shortly after that. I mean, she was in the hospital just a few days and passed away. I mean, I'm very um, thankful that she didn't suffer a long time, but she did suffer while she was sick those few days. Um, and so you probably, you may not know the answer to this and that's okay. Being that her advanced directives might've said, you know, I don't want life support. Do you know how she got intubated? I don't know. 
yeah. how that worked. And I have to ask Peter about that. They may have done it just so we could come and say goodbye to her. Yeah. To be quite honest. Yeah. No. And that's 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 okay that you, you don't know. But also sometimes, uh, sometimes the paperwork isn't there, and they're not able to ask the person. Right. Right, that's possible too, but they would have been able to ask Peter. So I don't know. I'm not even sure it said on her advanced directive she didn't yeah. want to be kept alive by artificial means, but I don't think, I think that there were no heroic measures to keep her alive. I know that much, but I'm not sure, you know, ventilation, yeah. it could have been temporary. Mm -hmm. They told her it could be temporarily done and removed. I don't know, you know, yeah. to be honest, that's what they had agreed on. So maybe they, she said, at the time, I mean, I know she was lucid and she was lucid when I talked to her, even though she was on a ventilator. Mm -hmm. She was lucid before that, they may have asked her permission to put her on a ventilator and she yeah. said, yeah. Yeah, no, she, they definitely could have done that. Um, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. like people will actually tell them that they wanna be put on the ventilator. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but you weren't, and you, you say you were being dismissive with her. Um, she wanted to go home, but I don't really. Um, did, now, did you ask the healthcare facility, the doctors, nurses, or anything like? Is it even possible for her to go home? I don't know if I did or not. I don't yeah. believe I did. I just think I just dismissed it. I, yeah. I think that they had just told us that she was going to pass away and to say goodbye. It was kind of a foregone conclusion. You yeah. Know? Okay. Um, I may have said something to the nurse actually, but I don't think yeah. I said. I kind of said it framed may have framed it in that I you know was dismissing it you know mm -hmm. like oh she wants to go home but uh, but you know we're not going to send her home right you know it's that kind of thing so it wasn't like yeah you know I she could have said something but it's not I didn't really it was more me it was on me it wasn't the hospital as much as it was me I think um and did she, did Peter ever, did you and Peter ever have like a conversation about that? Like, oh, she wants to go home. That's not really possible. Or was it just you kind of? No, we were both there when she yeah. said it. Um, I kind of, we, I looked at him when I, she said that to me and I yeah. said, she wants to go home. We can't send her home. She can't get off the ventilator because when we take the ventilator out, the doctor told us she's going to pass away. And that's what I knew to be yeah. the case. Yeah. Now, you were saying something about people can be sent home on ventilation. Yeah, and so um, when palliative care or hospice gets involved, not really any doctor can do this, right? Um, like any doctor can kind of plan it, but there's just a lot of little moving pieces going on that a lot of times palliative care or the hospice team is consulted to kind of help that happen. Um, it happens at times when there's a possibility that the person will live long enough to make that trip, right? There's also like so many technical things that go along with it. It's like, how far away did she live? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that too. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and yeah. I guess let me ask you this. I mean, sort of to that point, well, I mean, at what point do we think that it's more damaging to her or more painful to her to keep her on the ventilator long enough just to get her home, you know? Right. So, yeah, I mean, so say it takes another hour for her to get home and that's an hour longer that she has to be in pain whereby she can actually pass at the hospital and, you know, be not be in pain any longer. Yeah, I mean, be comfortable. So I yeah. don't know, I mean, it is kind of a crapshoot. Yeah, um, and so I mean the different, I mean like one option there is that we did is um, a lot of times ambulances won't transport the patient intubated to the home because that means you kind of, you have to get like a critical care ambulance involved. Um, and that's just, that's other paperwork and technicalities. But sometimes what I've seen done is you this person gets intubated we wait like 20 minutes or so and then we can put them on what's called like a bipap mask mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so that's also another possibility there was a gentleman that we recently did that with and you know i i didn't follow through all the way um 
didn't know what organization was accepting him, but I never found out if he made it home alive. And then there was the possibility that he didn't make it home alive. So when you're in that situation, um, it's really, like you said, it's, what do you do? And I think the easiest thing to do, or not even the easiest, but the most comfortable thing to do and what makes most sense is to allow the person to pass there, unless they see that they're gonna be like, they're gonna keep breathing on their own for a little while. So and I don't- then, uh -huh, Go ahead. Well, in contrast, my father passed away a couple of years later and he asked for the same thing, he wanted to go home. And so we did bring him home. Um, he wasn't on a ventilator. I think he had been on a ventilator and then they extubated him and, um, he went home, but he was very, um, he didn't know where he was he, and he, and the hospital was so horrible. This was in Las Vegas. Um, they didn't send any medication home or any prescriptions home with him. They, we got directions, but no prescriptions. So he was on painkillers and even opi uh, opioids when he was in the hospital. Yet when he got home, there was nothing to give him. So we were just sitting there with this man in pain at home. Oh and we ended up having to uh, take him back to the hospital by, by ambulance the next day because he was already failing. So, I mean, I got lots of different, that one I don't have any, I can't say I have any personal regrets about that one because we honored his wishes, but mm -hmm. to be honest, the hospital really dropped the ball on that one. I mean, really terrible. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, you never know, Regina, you know, when you, you're dealing with different deaths, they're all, all different, you know? Yeah. And that's what, um, a lot of times I, like my goal partially is to help try to educate people so they can advocate for themselves and for their loved ones, right. you know, like, you know, was hospice or palliative care involved with, with that situation? My dad's. Yeah. Well, we tried to put my dad on hospice. I don't know if you remember this story. This was another story I shared in class. Hospice, mm -hmm. he was a diabetic and hospice would not allow him to uh, use insulin. So we said, no, we're not going to put him on hospice because he's got probably a couple months to live. And if we put him on hospice, then he's mm -hmm. going to die tomorrow if he doesn't have his insulin. So what do you want us just to actively kill the guy? I mean, really, it was very, I didn't, I didn't like the way they, they dealt with that. So, you know, I think it kind of, in this, those cases, it boils down to being an advocate for your sick person. You know, mm -hmm. these sick people have to have an advocate. And we all knew that he, we didn't want him to be on hospice if that meant not getting insulin. And, and I remember in the course that we were talking about it, I'd never heard, the professor said, I'd never heard of anyone being deprived of insulin on hospice. And I said, well, it's, Welcome yep. to Las Vegas Healthcare, you know. So um, they were not known for really good healthcare. So um, yeah. Uh, so I think the advocate thing is so important. You know, having somebody like that whole hospital not bring, not sending home medication, uh, and the hospice saying, you know, talking about the insulin. I mean, there's so many things that we need to advocate for mm -hmm. for people. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. And all those things they could, you know, of course, I don't know the organization or the time that this was necessarily in. I feel like there have definitely been some, there's constantly changes also. With mm -hmm, the, um, mm -hmm. This was 2007. Yeah, I know. I think since yeah. my parents died and since my mother-in-law died, I think really there, there's been a huge uh, change in healthcare for the better as far as palliative and hospice care are concerned. Yeah because definitely that's something you should not be deprived of. Um, and there's patients that go to hospice on even, like it's rare, but on dialysis sometimes because they just feel more comfortable when they get dialyzed. So, and that's something new that I'm, I'm learning. Yeah, well, that yeah. makes sense to me. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the difference. And again, this class that we just took, we're um, learning about, um, the different we learned originally the difference between palliative care and hospice care and i think they both have a little different goals i mean hospice knows that you're gonna pass away with them palliative care wants to give you comfort so 
uh, I think there's some kind of competing goals there, you know? So they didn't emphasize the palliative portion of, of his care, you know? I mean, being comfortable and being on insulin and being able to survive, that was important for a diabetic, you know? Right. Yeah, no, and that's unfortunate that, you know, you said, like you said, you honored his wishes and then it ended up being probably more painful and uncomfortable for him. Absolutely. So, you know, with you saying you have regrets about your mother-in-law, about Amy, you know, I think it definitely happened for the best that way. And she probably, like, as you mentioned, she probably would have suffered more if you would have tried to get her home, yeah. especially intubated. Yeah. Well, I think talking it through with Peter just now and to you right now, it really does help me process that. I think I feel a lot more comfortable kind of talking that through and talking about how um, being on a ventilator on the way home would just be more painful discomfort, you know, more discomfort, um, mm -hmm. prolong her life unnecessarily. I kind of think maybe we did make the right decision, but I wish I had put more thought into it actually at the time, but now I feel comfortable with the decision, you know? Yeah, no, and that's Thanks. what I, you know, I definitely, I agree with you. Could you have put more thought into it? Sure, but you also have to, like you're human too, right? And I know you said, you, I know you're, you're very intelligent, but you're going through so much stress yourself. I mean, there's only so much a human being can comprehend right. during this time period. Right. So, and that was just like a completely, I think like when she brought that up, it was a complete surprise, like out of nowhere, you're expecting to go there to say goodbye to her in the hospital. And then she can, you know, just kind of throws you off completely with wanting to go home. Um, Okay. And did you ever, I guess, did you and Peter, because of that, um, decide to ha make an advanced directive or write one after those situations? Or did you always kind of have one? We had it. We, 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 we didn't have it. I don't remember when we wrote our advanced directives. Well, we had our whole will done. And I think it was, I don't remember what year. I want to no, say it was probably after both my parents passed away too. Uh, yeah, it was um, right around the, maybe three years after his mom passed away. And I don't know if it was because of that or just mm -hmm. we were thinking we have a daughter that we don't want her to have to suffer through decision-making for us. We want her to, you know, have it easy. Yeah. Actually, probably because of my parents' death, um, we made that decision because my parents didn't have an advanced directive or a will and and that made it difficult for me since I was the um, executor of, his, of my parents will and so um, they didn't of their uh, not their estate but their whatever you call it um, yeah so that was difficult so I think maybe that had more influence on me and Peter doing our advanced directives and our will and things like that yeah have you talked to your daughter at all about what's on the advanced directives or? Uh, on, not the advanced directives, but on the will. So probably the advanced directives, that would be a really great idea, Regina. Thank you for giving me that, yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, do you know, it's like the, the biggest thing that I think I've learned, you know, for me before even this, this course or this master's, I was like really big on advanced directives and having it planned out and written, written down. But the more <laughs> we discuss advanced directives um, and all the confusion that can occur, I'm just really realizing that, yes, it's important to have it written down. But it's also important to make sure you discuss it with the person that's going to be making those decisions. Right, right. right. Um, it's really important. You're right. And I think maybe we kind of have laid off of her because she's young and she's in college and she's, I don't want to stress her out any, but yeah. Maybe it was something we could bring up to her sometime. I think it's a very good idea. So I definitely will write that down. Yeah, of course. Um, and yeah, I always like, you know, everybody's different, but when I was bringing it up, what helped, um, I guess, Yuri deal with it was like me emphasizing to him, I'm doing this 
so it's easier for you if something happens. So there's no confusion. And so wouldn't it be easier for you if there's no confusion and you hear me say it, then you don't have to wonder. Right, right. So, um, so is there something, I mean, there's probably like a few things that if, if your friend or whoever is listening to this, um, maybe going through something similar, or maybe has elderly parents, um, I guess, what are some things you would recommend to them or maybe like one thing that you would tell them? Yeah, I think having open communication about death is important. People in my parents' generation and people that were, and I think you probably know this too, because I think you're either first or second generation of your nationality. Um, I think people that are, my parents had that old European uh, kind of, uh, mentality where they didn't talk about death was almost like a curse to talk about death, you know? So I think now having open conversations, open dialogues about death, it's, it shouldn't be a taboo anymore. It should be something that we can talk about. I also think um, getting your advanced directive written, at least having an outline, you'll have at least a skeleton of what it is that you want done and, and something that won't be completely heinous will be done because it's in writing. Um, but what we're talking about now and what you had mentioned about making it a human document, making it a living document is so important. That means talking to humans about it and talking about it and, and letting it change and letting it change based on circumstances. So I think all of those things are extremely important and you've touched on them, most of them, mm. I would say. But touch, talking about death is not a taboo you know, subject, people. It's awesome and it's something we can all talk about you know yeah and it's funny that you brought up you know the the european mindset um because uh, my friend and i who's also first generation from russia here um <laughs> we just joked around about how it's like so um you know you'll just get shoot out of the room or you have to knock on wood and it's like god forbid you bring up poo 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you like sit over your shoulder and it's like, how dare you say that? Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and I think also then what I kind of thought about is it wasn't as, I think, important to talk about it in our, you know, maybe um, the older generations because they didn't have um, such a variety of medical advance. Right. They didn't have the choices. You're right. Yeah. Absolutely. So it was never like, okay, well, we have to talk about, um, you know, what we're going to do at the end of life um, because people just died. Mm -hmm. um, and now there are so many options of what to do and how to handle the end of life process. And it's, it's really is a blessing and it's great that we have all of these advancements, but I don't, you know, I don't think really anybody thought about how that would affect the older generation. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I really appreciate you having this conversation with me, um, really. So I really appreciate your vulnerability and your time. It means a lot. I appreciate you. I just think you're doing so much to advance this field and I just think you're a star. I really do. Oh, thank you. That's why I had to shout you out because you always, you're such a huge cheerleader for me. Oh, you are though. I am so impressed with you, Regina. I'm mean, keep fighting the good fight and I'll, I'll be there with you to do it, you know? Thank you, Denise. I appreciate that.